The Mina protocol is a fully featured blockchain, but it's super teeny with a file size of 22 kilobytes. How is this even possible? Comparatively, other blockchains could be hundreds of gigabytes. You can find their website at minaprotocol.com and it says by design the entire Mina blockchain is about 22 kilobytes the size of a couple of tweets. That's not the best part though. The best part comes in this next sentence so participants can quickly sync and verify the network. What this means is that any node that syncs this blockchain is in essence a full node. This leads to a much more accessible blockchain and significantly stronger decentralization. In other words, you could have a mobile device that is a full node, or a Raspberry Pi, or some IoT device. We are no longer delegating trust or resources to stronger nodes, and the crazy part is, as this blockchain grows, the size stays the same. So you can see here, they say that this is a fixed size. Mino is created by O of One Labs, and if you're familiar with data structures and algorithms, you might recognize O of One where this means constant, in this case, a constant size. So where these other blockchains, as they grow, they basically outgrow the smaller devices and become more centralized because only the larger computers can support the network. So we're gonna take a deeper look into the MENA protocol and try to figure out how this works, but just going into these new networks, you need to understand that it's fairly high risk. If you're throwing money at these networks, you may or may not get the return you expect and none of the content on this channel is intended to be financial advice. So research these projects on your own and only put in money that you're willing to lose. That being said, I think this is a very promising network. Taking a deeper look, Mina uses advanced cryptography and recursive ZK snarks to deliver true decentralization at scale. What in the world is a ZK snark? Well, you can scroll through here and they give a good explanation right here. They capture the state of the entire blockchain as a lightweight snapshot and send that around instead of the chain itself. It's like sending your friend a postcard of an elephant instead of a massive live animal. When the next block in the network is created, it takes a snapshot of itself with the snapshot of the previous state of the blockchain as the background. That new snapshot will in turn be used as the backdrop for the next block and so on and so on. Rather amazingly, while it can contain proof of an infinite amount of information, the snapshot always remains the same size. So, the first time I heard a snark, I was like, <laughs> the, the names people make for computer science and cryptocurrency stuff, it's insane. And then a few days later, I'm working on the computer. No, sorry, babe, I'm working on setting up my snarker. I'll have to hang out later. <laughs> Anyways... We're going to get back into what we were talking about. A ZK snark stands for zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge and refers to a proof construction where one can prove possession of certain information, such as a secret key, without revealing that information and without any interaction between the prover and verifier. In other words, it's a way I can prove that I have something in my possession without actually showing you that thing. You see, I have this bag here, and there's actually a Pokemon card inside of it. You trust me, right? Psst, no, you don't trust me. You want me to show you? Psst, no. All right, I'll show you. And here we have a Pokemon card. However, if we had a snark in this situation, I could prove that I have this Pokemon card without actually showing you that card. This ZK snark can allow for a level of privacy because you can verify that a transaction is legit without actually seeing who is sending who money. This is why this is the foundation for cryptocurrencies like Zcash, which claims to be the first widespread application of ZK snarks. Where transactions in Zcash can be fully encrypted on the blockchain, yet still be verified as valid under the network's consensus rules by using ZK snark proofs. I think a lot of this information can be brought back to this guy here, who if you look closely is the co-inventor of Zerocash and the co-founder of Zcash and co-founder of Starkware Industries which we'll talk about that in a second. So this dude was the professor of one of the people who created Mina, who was studying for a PhD at Berkeley. Snarks are also used for layer two solutions on Ethereum to help scale the Ethereum network. So if you scroll through here, you'll find zero knowledge rollups. Zero knowledge rollups, also known as ZK rollups, bundle or roll up hundreds of transfers off chain and generate a cryptographic proof known as a snark. This is known as a validity proof and is posted on layer one. This means that ZK rollups only need the validity proof instead of all transaction data. 
And funny enough, this other thing here, the Starkware Industries, is actually a company who does layer 2 scaling for Ethereum. And just to show you guys how terrible my internet is, it's awful. Look at this, it's just spinning for days. So you can see here, StarkNet is a permissionless decentralized ZK rollup over Ethereum. The way the file size stays the same is by creating a snark of multiple snarks. This is known as a recursive snark. By chaining these certificates together in a recursive composition, it allows the blockchain to remain a constant size of around 20 kilobytes. You can go in here and see that the snark verifies all of the rules for consensus. With a snark, transactions are signed, they are valid, and the consensus rules are all being followed. My personal opinion is that this is the big takeaway. No need to delegate trust to those willing to keep up with the requirements to operate a full node, as is the case in traditional blockchains. Obtain full node level security on virtually any device by downloading a single snark, which acts as a certificate for the entire blockchain. So there we go. I've exhausted my understanding and I was probably just literally scratching the surface. So let's get to the point. How do you actually get Mina? Well, unfortunately, they just had a pre-sale like a few days ago. And it was for everyone except the United States, which is great, being from the United States. So maybe you got the chance to partake in the pre-sale, but unfortunately I did not. But they were selling for 25 cents a pop. Oh, no, not, not like this kind of pop. Like, one Mina was 25 cents. Is that good? Is that bad? Well, you should really consider the total supply, the monetary policy, and... And then, you know, hindsight is 2020, but this ended up going on exchanges for $9. Nine. Versus 25 cents. It's crazy. Now, unfortunately, that was just for those who sold immediately because the price went down real quick, which is not totally uncommon for new cryptocurrencies to start at a high price. And then there's a lot of sell pressure because everybody has this coin they want to sell. So the price goes down. So you can see the price here, May 31st at $9.04. And now it's kind of floating around $3, 350 360 But it stabled out pretty quickly, which is nice to see. I mean, it hasn't been around too long. What is the day? It is uh, the 7th. So it's been about a week. So now, all of us other people that didn't get in this pre-sale, we have to buy it straight out. So the exchange I recommend is Gate.io, mainly because I'm from the U.S. And this exchange has helped me get a lot of newer cryptocurrencies. So you can go in here, search Mina, grab the USDT pair or the Bitcoin pair, and that's basically what you're going to buy it with. So in this case, we have 18 USDT, which you can fund your account. Uh, I talk about that in so many videos. I'm not going to go through that whole process, but basically you can click deposit here or you can deposit USD. You will want to KYC if you want to use USD or if you want to withdraw even your cryptocurrency. So with this price, you can just say the amount you want to buy. For example, four, you know, <laughs> confirm that order. Oh, just kidding. The minimum is 10. Yeah, you get the point. You'll just need to adjust that price to make sure it gets met, whatever the price is based right here. But whatever, that's not the point of this video. I'm not here to talk about Gay.io, but I did want to give a reasonable place to start if you want to buy this cryptocurrency, and I'll leave a link to all the resources in the pinned comment. You can get all the information on the circulation and the monetary policy from this page here as well as the economic white paper. But uh, I just prefer web pages, I guess. Maybe I'm weak, who knows. Anyways, you can go through here and find a potential for an initial of 1 billion supply starting off. I don't exactly know if that's what happened or where that number comes from. This will fully unlock over eight years, known as the initial distribution, the inflation rate of 12% for those who are staking, and this will slow down to 7%. This will be multiplied based off of what percentage of the network is staking. So there's a block reward multiplier. If not everybody is staking, then those staking rewards could be higher. And you can read through all this and get the details. Uh, but yeah, the main concern I have, not really a concern, but just thing to be aware of, is that the supply for this cryptocurrency is very high. When you consider a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, 21 million cap, well, 1 billion is significantly more. So there's no real hope for me that this is going to get really high in price compared to some of the lower supply cryptocurrencies, but I do see it still having the potential to go up in price. Even with 1 billion in circulation, priced at $3.5, that's only 3.5 billion. Only. I mean, that's like my student loan debt. It's hardly anything. 
Whereas, you know, Bitcoin at one point was 1 trillion. So there's still a lot of room to grow for this cryptocurrency if people adopt it. And also there's no max supply for this cryptocurrency. So it's just gonna grow at 7% every year. So if you're not having your cryptocurrency staked, then basically you are working against yourself because you have to compete with the inflation. Just like if you held a bunch of United States dollars or whatever fiat currency you had in a box in your closet, which I totally don't do that. I don't know why I pointed over there. There's nothing. <laughs> People are gonna think I'm like, a bunch of cash well then basically it becomes worth less over time assuming the value stays the same so you'll want to make sure you're staking and you can do this yourself or you can delegate your stake to a dedicated node so here from the documentation it'll talk about the requirements if you want to be a node to add new blocks to the blockchain known as a block producer so you'll need an eight core processor and 16 gigabytes of ram i put my plotter to good use here because i don't need that for plotting anymore and you'll go through the steps on here, and this is for Ubuntu 18. They have a guide in their testnet general for Ubuntu 20, which is what I'm using. And you can find all those steps here. Uh, not too bad. It took me like a little bit of time to figure it all out, but I got it working. And you can just go through the steps of the documentation if you want to go through this whole process. So you'll generate a key pair, connect to the network, and then you can learn about staking and delegation. So here is where you can learn how to stake Mina on your own node, or if you don't have enough funds or the computer to do your own node, well then you can also delegate your Mina to another node for some fee. So this is essentially going to work the same way pooling works with cryptocurrency mining, Basically, someone has a dedicated node for staking. You can delegate your stake to that node. You get the majority of the rewards, and they're probably going to keep back a small fee. The final way that you can earn this cryptocurrency is through snarking, which is the process of actually doing the computation of creating these snarks that everybody can verify. So compressing data in the MENA network, here is how you set up your snark worker. As a snark worker, you get to share some of the block reward for each block your compressed transactions make it into. The block producer is responsible for gathering compressed transactions before including them into a block and will be incentivized by the protocol to reward snark workers. In a note, snark workers can be fairly compute intensive. So that was a pretty rough overview. I'm pretty new to the MENA network, so I'm sure I could learn a lot more about all these different capabilities. But basically, long story short, if you want to get involved, you can buy the cryptocurrency if you believe it's going to go up in value. You can be a block producer, which is the equivalent of a miner in this situation, and you can stake your cryptocurrency directly or delegate your stake to another block producer. Then you could also be a snarker and actually do the compression for this network. So hopefully this was a good introduction. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or my go-to is always like favorite beverage, but you know, I've already asked that like five times. What's your favorite cryptocurrency? Drop it in the comment section below and explain why. That's all I got for this one, so stay tuned for the next video. Peace out and be sure to subscribe.